and a very good evening to all the delegates and faculty members i am dr dhammadeep dabade and on behalf of m pharmaceuticals limited i welcome you all on the occasion of no thrombosis live inbox no thrombosis live inbox is the scientific initiative by mpa wherein we learn and understand about various cardiovascular interventions based on the live case presentations it's my privilege and honor to welcome and introduce course director for this webinar dr shirish hiramat sir sir is the director cath lab at ruby hall pune been the president of csi 2017 convener for national international council of india csi 2004 to 6 proctored many international cardiologists and has given live courses across the globe sir participated in some ground breaking trials welcome sir it's my privilege and honor to welcome and introduce course moderator for this webinar dr girish nosundi sir sir is the senior international cardiologist and director cath lab apollo hospital bangalore sir has extensive experience in the field of cardiology sir performed over 1700 angiograms through femoral l and approach sir has printed for several journals welcome sir thank you it's my privilege and honor to welcome and in our course moderator dr ankit deria sir sir the consultant international cardiologist at various hospitals across mumbai holy family sl reja global hospital also bhartiya arogyanidhi critical asia kj somaya and life care hospital sir is the organizing committee member for national cardiology conferences by international forum of cardiology cardiology summit 2015-18 and cardiology update 2015-17 sir has authored various book chapters like single vessel care at national cardiology textbook 2018 of csi and the chapter heart failure in young and elderly at national medical update 2017 of cpi welcome sir it's my privilege and honor to welcome and introduce speaker dr ganesh seth sir sir is the consultant and international cardiologist at department of international cardiology medanta heart institute lucknow sir will be presenting on coronary perforation welcome sir thank you it's my privilege and honor to welcome and introduce speaker dr sri harsha guttukon sir sir is the chief consultant at department of vascular and endovascular surgery at harsha vascular center vijayawada and sir will be presenting on topic new dimension on management of post operative arterial diseases in pvt agenda for today's webinar opening remarks by the moderator followed by first case presentation by dr ganesh seth sir and the case discussion by the moderators on the given case second case will be presented by dr sri harsha gutti kunda sir and there will be the case discussion followed by the case presentation between the moderators we will be having the concluding remarks by the moderators and vote of thanks with this now i would like to hand it over to course moderator dr girish nosundi sir for his opening remarks for this webinar over to girish sir thank you dr deep uh, thank you mqr has been doing this wonderful uh, human duty of discussing primarily the thrombosis and you know the major cause of death today is cardiovascular disease and among them the most common is the thrombosis and we have not uh, restrained or limited ourselves to just the coronaries we're looking at coronaries cerebral peripheral 
we are discussing all this on this platform which has made this one of the most favorite meetings across the country and today we have two wonderful dr gotikorna and uh, uh, dr shok both of them presenting cases and uh, i expect to have a very lively conversations thank you and uh, i would request the first presenter uh, to take on from here over to dr ganesh sir for your presentation okay thank you thank you everyone thank you mk or and thank you sir for uh, uh your kind uh, introduction as well as uh, uh, proceedings and uh, i hope uh, my slide is visible yes, yes dr ganesh <clears throat> thank you so going to my case my case is a, 50, a 64 year old female who is presented with a chest pain for a chest pain on exertion for 3 months and her angiography was done to her back and had a moderate disease in the LAD and RCA and she was on medical management since then but now since last three months uh, her uh, pain was aggravated that is why he came to us and her blood test investigations were normal today it was done which was also normal patient was taken uh, to cath lab to look into the coronaries this is the right sin where you can see there is no uh, much occlusive thrombus or uh, disease in the right system and this is the left sin where you can see the left main is normal and proximal led as well as the proximal lcx is uh, disease free this is the cranial sin uh, where you can see there is a 80 to 90% disease in the mid segment of the led this is the disease in the mid segment of the led so uh, we first uh, bell, uh, we have done balloon dilation of the disease segment and then a 3 by 23 stent was placed in the led this was the flow we obtained after placing this uh, stent but in the stent boost we saw a slight depression in the middle segment of the stent so we thought we should uh, dilate it and we dilated that but after dilation this is what we uh, found and the patient was slightly restless and we saw a large perforation which is grade three perforation in the stented segment especially from the uh, middle to lower side of the stent so uh, we took uh, craft plaster that is a covered stent in the in, in stent to cover that leakage and then uh, after craft plaster the perforation was sealed and patient was uh, looked at the echo was then uh, reviewed and there was a minimal effusion at the time of uh, 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 procedure at the, at the table and after 15 minute again a check injury was done and which was uh, there was no uh, leak, further leakage in the stent and uh, we successfully covered the hole of the perforation so patient was properly managed with the covered stent and reduction after 15 minute was uh, uh, done and no leak was observed at the time of procedure uh, only 2 to 3 mm of pericardial fluid rim was observed. Uh, was seen and patient started having uh, mild chest pain but in the night she developed a hypotension uh, with the mild breathlessness with the tachycardia and injection nodded was started could be was reviewed again then the 22 mm anterior rim of the pericardial effusion was seen with the underfilled rv now the tlc was done which was also increased to 24000 and creatinine which uh, creatinine is also increased to 1.8 which was previously 1.02 so we took the patient to cath lab again check and was done there was no further leakage but uh the urgent pericardial synthesis was done at the at the table and 200 ml peri hemorrhagic fluid was aspirated breathlessness gradually improved not at not at stopped by afternoon and patient gradually uh, improved hemodynamically chest pain improved breathlessness 
improved and the next day to deco was done and no further filling was observed in the uh, last 24 hour uh, and then trigger sheet was removed on the next day she was planned for discharge although there was psychosis then psychiatry opinion was done and finally patient was discharged successfully and without any pain and without any further expansion of the pericardial fluid rim in the echo so this is just to uh, sh- uh tell us tell the importance of the covered stent that should be available in the whole cath lab there are two types of covered stent but one is the craft master from the abbot and then second is the papyrus from the biotronic they both have a uh, different sizes and diameter craft master comes from 2.8 to 4.8 with the, the length of 16 19 and 26 and then the paris come with the two uh, come in the diameter of 2.5 to 5 with a length of 15 20 and 26 and we as a intervention cardiologist should know uh, should be familiar with the covered stent because uh, whenever this this type of perforation especially the grade 3 perforation occurs it is a uh, actually life threatening condition if not tackled immediately then it can lead to mortality and the uh point which should be remembered we should be in your mind wh- while using the covered stent is that that the length of ptf file in the stent uh, uh, is shorter than the uh, struct length and after the expansion of the stent the ptf file may may be up to 1.6 mm from the each end of the stent graft so the covered length is uh, can be 3.2 mm shorter than the whole stent length So to summarize, uh, coronary artery perforation is fortunately a rare but serious life-threatening complication of the perfor- of the PCI, which is the uh, which can lead to the cardiac tamponade, uh, cardiac shock, myocardial infarction, or even death if there is no prompt intervention. And coronary uh, per- perforation with, uh, of ELS type one, where only crater is visible, and uh, type two, where there is a hematoma and blush in the myocardium. can be managed conservatively with the uh, with the serial echo monitoring especially in the type 2 and uh, uh, if type, there is type 2 it can be managed uh, uh, with the uh, prolonged balloon inflation also and serial echo cardiography is, uh, obviously should be done to rule out any hematonic consequence of the pericardial effusion or any uh, expanding effusion then covered stent obviously they should be available in in all of the cath labs and there are two uh, types of uh, coverings ptfe as well as polyurethane and uh, uh, like uh, in craft master this is the ptfe covered while uh, papyrus is a polyurethane covered although there is no much difference in uh, uh, in the outcome from both are uh, covering the main disadvantage of uh, these type of covered stent is that uh, they are there is a high thrombogenicity and occlusion of covered branches if there is any cord, uh, any branch passing through that of the stented segment so uh, so covered stents should be available in the all cath lab and uh, intervention cardiologists should be familiar with these stent system so thank you thank you for your kind listening thank you dr ganesh uh thank you sir it's a very very common uh complication it is not a very unusual complication that we come across when you start discussing perforations i think the most important thing is how to prevent perforations it starts from there and once you suspect a perforation what all the things that you need you need every day in a pci lab you need to have a small box uh, which has these tools immediately available to you if required don't keep them somewhere far from where you are operating especially a pericardiocentesis system and a, a covered stent every time you start looking at a probability of a perforation you must tell the staff and keep i hope you have it on shelf you don't need it but you need to check with them every day i work in a busy lab my technicians will tell me suddenly sir last night it was used and uh, we don't have that size so when you start it in the morning you must make sure that what you call a bailout all of them are present for that morning 
not it was there yesterday we should not assume that it will be there tomorrow because something may have got used in the night if you're not the only operator first second perforation is a completely avoidable complication it is an iatrogenic complication it most ha- most often happens when we underestimate the expand cell capacity of the vessel in terms of calcium or a calcium nodule protruding uh, um, you know nodule or we oversize the stent many a times it's not oversizing the stent but it's oversizing the post dilation balloon and it is also more common in women in those areas where you said so my request always is although stent does not expand sufficiently at some point you need to look at minimal luminal area you need not make the entire stent cylindrical because if there is a large plug burden imagine if somebody had a 90% stenosis uh, which is discrete less than 15 mm and when you put it with 23 mm stent the portion of the uh, vessel where there is plug residual plug will not expand as much as where there is absolutely no plug because this plug has to be accommodated within the vascular constitution right so if you try to make the stent straight it is going to give away some place second i think when we choose a stent i think we should choose it from intima to intima on an oct or an ivus and when you post dilate never exceed e- external luminal means ell okay external elastic lamina you should never cause when you choose the stent size you use internal elastic lamina but when you choose post dilation you choose external elastic lamina so having image on board when you think the uh, stent optimization is not complete adds lot more clarity very rarely you may oversize and land up in perforation most of the time we undersize and leave behind malaposition or undersized stents very good discussion for bringing this on the third the minute you had a perforation patient becomes uncomfortable uh, you know such a free flowing uh, pericardial and the uh, perforation will definitely have hemodynamic significance because it was like torrential flow that is happening so you may not have been able to see it could be more posterior at that point in time or a very lateral because often time we see in the epigastrium when we, when we are doing the echocardiogram so you must anticipate third you must tell your cardiac icu doctor and nurse that you have had a perforation and you expect this patient to have a hypotension and if there is a hypotension this patient needs volume correction not inotropes often time they will call you that sir patient is having shock and not responding to three inotropes patient does not need inotropes he is losing blood somewhere and the chamber that gets compressed is the right ventricle so you need to clearly tell them please keep looking at the rv look at the ivc if it is collapsing you need to call me i need to blindly put in a stick a needle in pericardium and draw the fluid out so these are the couple of things that uh, you need to keep in mind that i know if some cardiac cardiac intensive starts i know trope on a patient who has had perforation it's a disaster because i know you will you will wait too late before start treating cardiogenic shock so you should tell them if there is a need for i know trop call me i need to make sure that there is no uh, tamponade and lastly once i think uh, you used a good size covered stent two things i would like to tell you covered stent is not a normal stent you just can't inflate it like a regular stent and uh, hope to seal it it takes lot more time to expand and opposed to the uh, wall that means the native stent that you have put which is uh, ds which is perforated and you have put in a, a covered stent 
the gap between the covered stent and native stent will still cause some amount of leak so you need to go at at least 18 or 20 atmosphere pressures for at least 15 20 seconds to seal entry and exit points of that otherwise your covered stent may be mal opposed to a large extent and the leak can continue and as i said the minute as you clearly said you know try and take the correct size never be very precise with a short covered stent many of the time you miss the perforation so take a little larger but unfortunate thing when this happens in led because you lose lot of septals and diagonals so you can't take a blindly a very long covered stent too because you're going to leave behind lot of residual ischemia so these are the things to consider if i were you i would still uh, you know take a chance that i will occlude the led uh, without a covered stent for a while because it didn't look so nasty this is in the vessel if occluding the balloon for a minute or 3 uh, if it seals i may uh, not put a covered stent in led because it's got many septals and many diagonals but if it's an rna at, at the site of a uh, stent there is no there is no diagonal although septals might not be visible but uh, there is not uh, no any big diagonal at that site no uh, excellent i think your judgment was very you have been appropriate but i'm just t- telling you thinking loud what if it was you know proximal to mid across on large diagonal and large septal in the hurry in that anxiety of uh, big perforation the i- instinct is to put in a stent covered stent i think we can keep this as a backup strategy that let me just blow up a balloon take a minute or 3 to see whether do i really need a covered stent if it is needed you should always put in but then if i can avoid why not and the large and largely i think you need to put the patient now definitely for at least 12 months of dual antiplatelet and then uh, take a call on it uh thanks for bringing this case lot of points for discussion and i'll Thank request you. my co moderator uh for uh, uh, his com- uh, comments on this uh, dr ankit if you could uh, come on and comment on that yeah good evening sir and a uh, uh, very good presentation dr ganesh congratulations for the result uh, sir as uh, dr girish has covered most of the things which uh, uh, we should do in a perf case uh just to ask you that what was the diameter of the post dilatation uh, balloon that you took 3 by 12 312 and your uh, and your stent yes. diameter was also 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3 yes 323 so, so that was important because technically if you see you have not upsized beyond the size of the stent now sometimes possibility is there that there would be a calcium spicule yeah. <laughs> given away uh, given way and you know this has caused such a large perf and uh, also would not want to know what was the diameter of the pk papyrus that you took uh i took uh, uh, that uh, graft master graft master how, what was the diameter of graft master uh, it was 2.8 by 19 so that so dr girish has pointed us a very important factor that your diameter of the stented segment was 3 and the diameter of the graft master was 2.8 so till what pressures did you go to 16 16 so which which is not very bad which was good because graft master uh, uh, nominal pressures would be more than 12 so you've got up to 16 so assuming that the 16 atmospheric pressures would would probably oppose uh, up to a 3 mm stent so despite you going up to 16 atmosphere as dr girish rightly said that such covered stents have a lesser di- now in your case also 3 versus 2.8 the diameter was slightly on the lesser side going up to a more than nominal dilatation or pressures was important and sometimes because of such situations there is some seepage of blood which has occurred uh, in your case also despite getting a good angiographic result but there would be some seepage of blood 
which has passed through between the two struts like the graph master and the stent and uh, also that is why presentation was quite late in fact i have completed the case in the evening and uh, i received a call that he is in uh, she is in the hypertension in the in the night correct so so yes so that that is one dr girish has covered beautifully all the points and uh, so there is nothing much to add but yes diameters of the graph master many a times see now at our center at holy family at bombay we got two graph masters one is 2.5 and one is 3 but sometimes uh, perfs occur at a diameter of 3.5 we had a recent perforation which happened at a 3.5 vessel which was post dilated to 3.75 then we were uh, in a big fix because we had only a 3 3 mm diameter stent graph master then we went and we blew it to uh, we took a 319 and we dilated it up to 24 atmospheric pressures which was again scary so as sir rightly said that your your uh, shelf of uh, these instruments and your hardware has to be checked on a daily basis that made us uh, that the same stand was used on else a week back and our technicians were not able to cover it up or you know get a replacement for that so these are important points that dr girish has wonderfully you know elicited and uh as rightly said by him that iv fluids uh, at full strength um, patient going on norad so these are certain things and uh what he said is right that we should inform the cardiac icu that we need to do an echo interim echo so you did the case at in the evening and you got a call maybe 7 hours or 6 hours later am i wrong am i wrong i don't know how many hours later did you take the patient 5 hours later 5 hours so 5 hours is probably a bit too much i would be more uh, keen on getting a fresh echo done maybe at 1 or 2 hours post the uh, echo monitoring was done every 2 hours okay early. there was a pdcc there was a consultant who is looking after that echo okay. but uh, i received a call from hypertension after 5 hours so yeah but but because the perforation was quite large if you see the yes, gush yes. of blood so possibility of this blood getting collected immediately before you put and possibility after you put a graft passer also is there so but 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 good that the patient did very well and congratulations once again to you thank you sir sure thank you one last point i want to add just because we take a diameter of stent and we implant it don't assume that it is become that size if i take a 4 mm stent and implant it from left main to lad in lad it does not become 4 mm unless i go at 12 atmosphere even if i go at 8 or 10 atmosphere it will still stay at 3.5 or 3.25 so often times when we take a millimeter stent and then you implant and when you look at the proximal and distal edges of the stent being very well opposed or slightly oversized than the native vessel and then you have a residual stenosis in within the stent then it's not appropriate to take a 3 millimeter nc balloon and go at a higher pressure because probably vessel diameter is not 3 millimeter in a healthy segment the vessel looks already slightly over expanded so vessel size itself could be 2.75 this is just an intuition that you must develop not chase just a cylindrical stent on a stent boost but imagine i think the more you will start imaging you will realize a stented area of more than 2.5 mm square is going to give you hardly any events in the distal mid to distal lad and i'm sure here you had achieved more than 3 and 1/2 or 4 mm squares so what i meant to say is uh, when you think should i do or not please consider the area that you could have achieved and we have seen anything more than 80% area achieved there are not too many clinical events especially in mid to distal lady thank, thank you again okay thank you thank you dr sun uh, ganesh and uh, we would like to go to the next case please I request Dr. Sunil Arshad sir to go for your presentation and share yours. Yeah.
Yeah, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Yeah, very good evening to uh, very good evening to all of you. It's my privilege uh, to be of this symposium. Uh, myself to introduce. I am Dr. Harsha. I am a vascular surgeon. Uh, located myself in uh, Vijayawada in Andhra Pradesh. I am particularly mentioning this point because uh, we are located about almost about the in the urban and the rural areas where we cover most of the villages around. So we deal lot of peripheral vascular diseases and uh, majority of the patients come at the end stage arterial diseases <clears throat> where already there is established gangrenes or uh, already infected wounds, already amputated wounds and also patients have multiple comorbidities with the age span of 60 to 70 years. So majority of the age where the PVD is involved and most and most of the people who are presenting to the hospital is about the geriatric age group, unfortunately. And uh, so, yes, compared to the statistics, in the, along with the coronary vascular disease or the cerebrovascular disease, the lower extremity peripheral vascular disease also is coming to the high scale. And the amount or the risk of limb loss and the risk of complications immediately after the revascularization is also significantly increasing. So immediately after any endovascular or any open bypass procedures or any peripheral angioplasties or stentings, we are noticing significant patients who are coming back. At least one out of the 10 patients are coming back with the rethrombosis or again the patient developing the hypercoagulability state, which is leading to the thrombosis or instant failures or reduced ankle brachial index leading to the claudication pains. Because there are various factors reasoning for this, maybe the patients are also not will be in the regular follow-ups, not on uh, proper medications and all these be the contributing factors. And uh, coming to the clinical scenarios, what we see here, most of the patients with the 45 to 50 or 50 to 60 age groups who are already having diabetes, hypertensive and also having associated coronary heart diseases. So almost 90%, 90 to 95% of the patients are also having associated coronary artery diseases or the previous history of MI or uh, any cardiac events. So here I'm going to share or a simple and normal case which we did recently in the last week. Most of the patients we have accelerated atherosclerosis involving the long segment. You can see the patient here. Uh, I hope my screen is visible, friends. Yes, 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 Dr. Asha. Go ahead. Yeah, here you can see the 65 year male patient. Uh, he presented with gangrene great toe and infected ulcer adjacent to it extending for dorsum. The ankle brachial index was done and the ankle brachial index of the index limb that is the right lower limb is showing 0 0.65. And uh, we can see the diffuse narrowing of the uh, superficial femoral artery at the adductor canal with chronic total occlusion of uh, uh, approximately 6 centimeters involving at the level of the knee joint. And distally, the flow is very less. You can see the monophasic flow in the do in the Doppler and also in the ankle brachial index. And uh, he's also having associated coronary artery disease. He's on anti hypertensive so he's on anti medications prior to the procedure. So we have uh, explained the patient attenders. We showed the risk. These are the typical presentations what we see here. Not only here, any patients here. They have abundant calcification along with atherosclerosis. Particularly in this case, it is a little bit less what I am presenting here. But we also have very much associated calcium deposition also. This is the one more case just to show it as a reference where you can see the calcifications and also area of diffuse calcification and also area of atherosclerotic diseases. I'll be just sharing the video of uh, uh, this one. This this is the catheter is placed and the multipurpose catheter is placed in C2. We did a diagnostic angiogram and you can see the CTO lesion at the level of the adductor canal. This is a diffuse uh, uh, occlusion and there is no flow beyond that lesion and there is reformation noted at the tibioperoneal trunk. So just past the O3-5 guide where I used the uh, 5 into 100 balloon where uh, we raised the pressure up to 15 mm mercury and you can see the balloon is inflated. And uh, little proximally also I covered the diffused lesion. 
where you can see the just dumbbell shape and the opening of the balloon here. So once the balloon was done, uh, the di diagnostic angiogram was repeated and you can see the good flow noted up to the ankle region. This is just a comparison between the pre and post operative pictures. Uh, where there is little bit of dissection and mild stenosis is noted. But again, as I told you, we also have a lot of financial constraints in these areas where majority don't have insurances or so we can't afford, the patients can't afford for majority of the stunting. So majority of the patients we do angioplasties and we'll keep them on regular follow-up, try to keep them in follow-up. So eventually the patient uh, developed good vascularity. The AP has raised to 0.9. And uh, the good biphasic signals are noted in both DP and posterior tibial artery and the wound started healing slowly. But the challenge for us is maintaining these patients because of the re that the re-thrombosis rate is very high. What we are trying to do is initially we have we used to keep the patients on antiplatelet medications, later dual antiplatelet medications, keeping on heparin or anoxaparin during the hospital stay. So now in the peripheral vascular disease, uh, the most, these are the few, what we have the important studies like Voyager peripheral artery disease trial, where it is compared 6,564 patients are taken in greater than 50 years of age. And the patient has undergone lower extremity very vascularization is compared to Rivaraxoban, Novak 2.5 mg plus aspirin with placebo plus the aspirin alone. So the bleeding tendencies are there with uh, Novak, but, but also compared to the major bleedings are not noticed. So in the cases of peripheral vascular disease, we, I significantly with my personal experience, what I noted is uh, the patient who underwent any kind of angioplasty, any kind of revascularization procedures with the balloon or with any stenting procedures, along with the antiplatelets in conjunction with Rivaraxoban or any NOAX with, uh, or uh, dual pathway therapies are giving significant uh, outcome. And the re rate and fatal bleeding rates are also very less. And uh, we also noted significant uh, maintenance of the wound healing. Uh, and also the patients are also on regular follow up with this anticoagulations. And coming to the clinical implications, what I believe is patient with peri PAD are the higher also high risk of cardiovascular events in spite of use of available risk reduction therapies. Then the strategies to reduce the risk are needed. So I think in the Voyager study, the vascular outcomes with uh, exclusive acid along with Rivaraxoban in endovascular or surgical limb has now demonstrated a robust benefit and net benefit for the combination of uh, anticoagulants twice daily with aspirin in surgical patients also. So my friends, I would like to just comment that the patient with critical limb ischemias and PVDs along with the endovascular or any open procedures, we are making it as a practice to keep the patients on NOAX post-operatively and manage the patient for at least with six months of follow-up with these anticoagulant regimens. Uh, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harsha. Uh, may I just ask you one question? Now, in your practice, how do you use for an acute intervention procedure from the day of procedure, how many, how do you give dual antiplatelets, which medication, what doses, and when do you start uh, dot like, you know, rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram twice daily? So uh, generally what we do is uh, generally we keep in the dual antiplatelets if the patient is having any hypercoagulability or the patient is having any thrombotic, acute on chronic presentations, like patient is having atherosclerotic disease and also thrombus also incorporated within the lumen. Right. Where we where we try to do a hybrid procedure and initially we treat at the time of post-operative, we have to keep on 75 mg clopidogrel necosprint at the time of discharge. Now, at right. present, what we are doing is, if the, I'm doing any hybrid procedures, like mm -hmm. the patient is, we are doing a thrombectomy and also like iliac angioplasty and followed by stent graft or any FEMPA bypass. Postoperatively, right. after the discharge, we are starting 2.5 mg BD and keeping it on follow-up for six months duration. 
Okay, so it's a triple therapy for six months at this. No, no, no. If I'm giving Novax, I'm keeping only clopidogrel seventy five MG. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, just to come back, I think uh, you know thrombosis and atherosclerosis they go hand in hand, and uh, we are realizing, in spite of potent dual antiplatelets, whether the aspirin, beyond clopidogrel, now we are using. Tecaglor and Prasugrel. In spite yes. of dual antiplatelet, very potent, there is still residual ischemic events that are happening. Means there are more thrombosis, more ischemia, restenosis, all are happening. Yes. Uh, to reduce these ischemic events, you need to look at what we call net clinical benefit. Every time you increase the antiplatelet or anticoagulation action, it comes at the cost of increased bleeding if you want to reduce ischemia some amount of bleeding would increase mm. but if that increase in the bleeding is not very dangerous not requiring hospitalization no intracerebral hemorrhages no uh, you know abdominal uh, gi bleeds then you are uh, you know safer in using them second you have to not only focus on high ischemic burden patients you also need to categorize every patient into what is the bleeding risk hbr what we call high bleeding risk patient population is significantly increasing these are people who have anemia who are elders frail who had a previous gi bleed um, who who require an anticoagulation there are multiple patients that will not tolerate uh, a uh, very high intensity anti platelet or coagulation uh, therapy but in most others where the do not belong to hbr category we as cardiologist uh, give for the first one month a uh, first one month to 12 months varying duration we give dual anti platelets and at the end of that if somebody has diabetes chronic kidney disease heart failure peripheral vascular disease we prefer to use a uh, 2.5 mg uh, rivaroxaban along with an aspirin rather than dual antiplatelets beyond that period because this dual pathway inhibition has shown to reduce future cardiovascular events and uh, those patients who have severe peripheral vascular disease and also coronary vascular disease these are very very ischemic patients they are chance of having another ischemic event is very high so the benefit also that accrue by addition of another anticoagulation could be more but you should be judicious to first calculate bleeding risk and then initiate these people second the duration of doax is still not yet known it seems like an indefinite choice that you will be making unless they fall into high risk group so we will start an them on an one antiplatelet and uh, 2.5 mg twice rivaroxaban how long we do not know i think this is my understanding and thanks for bringing this conversation again this is also very very uh, important discussion that just putting everybody on two antiplatelets may not solve problem of uh, quite a number of patients where you may need uh, a doac dr ankit i would request you to uh, make your expert comments on that yeah so uh, good case uh, dr shri and uh, i also feel the same that yes uh, rivaroxaban 2.5 mg in peripheral vascular diseases and complex cardiac cases is an important way to uh, you know tackle and prevent further mass events and uh, that's why 2.5 mg bid uh, as sir rightly said uh, is important and it's a good dose and uh, it definitely will help in your patient so congratulations for your case and uh, it it was an intriguing case to see such a uh, such a fantastic result after your uh, intervention thank you yeah thank you sir sir just for the point of discussion so generally after the open surgeries generally what we do is uh, as a vascular surgeon we do a fempop bypass we do ptfe grafting most of the times which is almost 35 to 40 cm length 
So initially, what we noticed is we, we used to keep them on enoxaparin or heparin during the hospital stay, followed by dual antiplatelets. Mm. Now, in this scenario, can we compare the same studies, whatever are there for the angioplasties, to the open procedures, and we can extend the anticoagulation doses to one year or six months because this is unpredictable for us during the practice. What we are noticing is very high rethrombosis rate who are having this associated coronary artery diseases. So in such situations, yes, uh, see, there is no data available for such situations where FEMPOP bypass, post FEMPOP bypass, whether uh, I don't know, Damdeep is, uh, I don't know, I have not come across any data for peripheral vascular disease, operative peripheral vascular disease, uh, followed up with no NOAC like that. But I think it's a good idea or good thought, but it has to be uh, backed up with, uh, you should not have bleeding tendencies in such patients because these patients do, Rivaroxaban 2.5 does, does have lesser be bleeding tendency as compared to the higher doses. But yes, it's it would be a good option where you can give an eco spin along with a rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BID uh, in your post FEMPOP bypass patients if the strength thrombosis or thrombus mm -hmm. burden is high in the post op phase. So it would be a good. So NOAC would be a preferred drug as compared to a clopidogrel, but I don't know how much data we have backed up with such a scenario. What do you yes. think, Girish? Oh, uh, I think very well said. Uh, you know, we have not reached the perfection of cocktails for uh, anti-thrombosis, mm. whether it is antiplatelets or anticoagulation. And there are so many trials where they're trying many drugs at different strengths, starting at different timelines uh, from the acute event. It is an ongoing uh, science. And whichever has certain uh, reliable data, I think we should... Uh, accept it and practice it. I think that's where rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram twice daily has been conclusive so far. But if you have another thought process like yourself, uh, Dr. Harsha, I think you should try 100 cases and publish what happens. Uh, uh, sure. So because you have those volumes, so you're treating so many of them. So please publish 100, 100 cases uh, that may help. But the problem what happens is in the best interest of the patients, many a time you may do what you think is right, but if it becomes a medical legal case, uh, will you have sufficient uh, safety for yourself? That becomes important. So when you want to do something different, my request to you, take a written consent that this is not the standard protocol, but you would like to treat this way and this could be the complications and I agree to it. That's for your own safety. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think, uh, thank you. Thank you. Being a vascular uh, surgeon and interventionist, we were doing all the procedures quite some time back and you guys have come and relieved us of this. And, uh, in the past, they were all coronary hardwares, but now you have your own wonderful hardwares. But still, we crisscross these days uh, into each other because of little expertise that uh, we have in our own domain, which becomes useful to the other person. And uh, managing thrombosis is also very, very common to us. Probably you do not have sufficient data in the uh, peripheral vascular uh, arena as compared to cardiovascular arena. I Bruce think you can borrow from us, but if you think there is, uh, you know, you would need a different strategy, please gather some data and share and we'll be really grateful. Yeah. Thank sure, you. Sir. Privilege. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Ankit, any other comments? No, sir. I also agree that uh, if you have good volumes, Dr. Shri, you can, as sir rightly said, probably uh, with a good medical legal backup, you can uh, get your own data published, and maybe it turns into a into a guideline. Yeah, uh, at least you know it becomes an expert consensus uh, right. if we start collecting proper uh, data. And we have right. so many patients in this country. We just need to have that 
scientific temperament and uh, as he says consents consents are very very important these days thank you uh, thank you team mq um, i think we have had a great meeting are there any questions in the chat box that need to be answered uh there are few of the questions but they are not too much clear uh, dr nasim is trying to ask something about the loading dose i think that's for the first case uh probably is asking for loading dose so anti platelets maybe tikka okay if i can briefly tell the loading dose for an aspirin could be anywhere between 75 to 325 mg uh loading dose of clopidogrel if it is not an emergent procedure then 300 mg if it's an emergency uh, intervention required then 600 mg is a loading dose for a prosugrel it is 60 mg loading dose followed by 10 mg once daily for ticagrelor it is 90 mg two tablets 180 mg loading dose followed by 90 mg two times daily if you are using ticagrelor then don't use an aspirin not exceeding 100 mg so you always use 75 mg because if the aspirin dose is more it uh, decrease the potency of uh, uh, ticagrelor uh these are the loading doses we use if you are giving uh uh rivaroxaban for a peripheral vascular disease or coronary artery disease 2.5 mg twice daily is the dose no loading dose required you just start with 2.5 mg stay twice daily any other question dr deep uh no they uh, dr anil agrawal try to ask something but again his question is unclear so uh, i couldn't read can you read out uh no sir he he just actually try to uh, share something but probably uh, okay. uh, so he was not able to put the question uh, rightly uh so i think uh, so that's no like problem. the towards the conclusion uh, of this uh, hourly webinar and uh, i'm really thankful to see the insightful discussion around this webinar i'm much thankful uh our speaker dr ganesh said sir for nicely and interestingly presenting his first case on coronary perforation followed by the the moderation and the discussion around to that i am much thankful on behalf of mpr to dr shri harsha sir for again wonderfully presenting his uh, case uh, of the pvd uh, with the interventions uh, what he just shown to us and both the moderators uh, dr girish sir as always you are with us for all the webinars throughout this series of the webinars uh, in each month and i uh, also thank dr ankit deria sir for sharing your valuable time and contributing to the discussion throughout this webinar with that note and uh, with the promise to come up with uh, once again the next webinar with some more interesting cases uh, i we i just uh, want to say a uh, good time ahead and a good night to all the delegates and faculty members thank you very thank you thank you thank you thank, thank you. you good night good thank night you. sir bye bye